Hi, and welcome to my talk. My name is Barack Kushner, and I teach Japanese history in the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. The title of my talk today is Anchors of History, Japanese Imperial Propaganda, and the Post-War. I'm reminded as I begin this lecture that perhaps it behooves me to start with an example from literature to place my story. And I believe the narrative I'm about to offer has fascinating links with Albert Camus' famous novel, The Stranger. That story is told from a French expatriate's point of view, which was, in a sense, who Camus was. But we are never told much about the man whom the protagonist murders for essentially no reason. The colonial side of the story is absent. Several years ago, an Algerian author, Kamel Daoud, cautioned us against the one-sided nature of this historical view. In his response, he penned a novel entitled The Merceau Investigation. In Daoud's new version, the colonial protagonist, the brother of the unnamed slain Algerian, explains his side of the previously unknown story. For me, this competition, through the example of a famous piece of French literature and the Algerian response, highlights the contemporary competition over the historical narrative of colonialism which is currently happening in French society. In a similar way as these two literary works lay out the scene of a murder and its backstory, reflecting French and Algerian historical positions, we can see the history of war crimes trials of Japan in the immediate post-war also from two angles. Here too is a competition over justice and a competition to tell the story of that history, which parallels what I think is occurring in historiographical circles in East Asia today. This history also provides a front row seat in the long durée of that influence. It's a revealing story on three levels. It shows the impact of empire, the interaction of the military and the public, and it demonstrates that the influence of imperial propaganda does not necessarily evaporate after victory or defeat. Themes of Japanese propaganda reverberated far beyond its own borders, and this matters because the legacy caused waves in the Republic of China, which is currently known as Taiwan, and the People's Republic of China, the PRC, or Communist China, long after the empire dissolved. To understand this evolution from the late 19th century to the present of Imperial Japan's rise and how that narrative later impacted the region propels us to look beyond the more formalized World War II story and to go further back in time. Japanese propaganda organized itself into a national experience with links to entertainment, while China's response to it helped to construct state legitimacy in the decades following the Second World War. To grasp the totality of that evolution, we need to investigate both sides of the equation. My talk today is therefore divided into an examination of Japan's imperial propaganda and then post-war China's uses of it. We need to start at the initial moments of discomfort in the modern era and then work forward through the post-war. The wartime chronicle has generated industries of publishing and is fairly well memorized by all both inside and outside of China. How the war was actually examined or imagined afterward has been shelved, replaced by much more simplistic animations of the past. We should exit the echo chamber in which we have placed ourselves and venture outside the prescribed parameters of the bespoke historical narrative to get to the heart of the matter. And there is no better place to start than with a rusty set of large naval anchors sitting in a park in central Tokyo. Propaganda might seem to dominate the stage in the Second World War, but it began long before. Arguably, Japanese national mobilization toward the expansion of empire began in the early Meiji era, but it took full root in the 1890s in the country's attempt to dominate East Asia. It was not, as always, of course, a smooth process, nor was Japan's victory preordained. In actuality, the linchpin in the early modern era can be traced back to August 1886, when several naval vessels of the powerful Qing Dynasty Northern Fleet pulled into the port of Nagasaki in southern Japan. This was the start of imperial conflict between a Qing Dynasty flexing its muscles and the upstart Japanese feeling the impact. Japan was only 20 years into its Meiji project to renovate the nation, and judgment was still out whether it would be able to succeed and modernize. Along with numerous other ships, 
the Qing fleet included several massive ironclad vessels, the prize of the squadron being the Dingyuan and the Junyuan. The Dingyuan was considered one of China's premier warships and dominated anything the Japanese maintained in their arsenal. In the late summer of 1886, within a few days after docking during its tour of maritime East Asia, dozens of Qing sailors from the ships had a rollicking time in the Maruyama red light section of Nagasaki. Riots with Japanese police and the public escalated to the point that pleas from local officials to the Qing consulate in town were dispatched. In the end, the disturbances left 74 injured with two Japanese and five Chinese sailors dead. The Nagasaki incident, as it came to be known, created a notoriously bad image of Chinese naval behavior on the archipelago. In part, this interaction unleashed a competition for supremacy in the region that would continue to feed behavior on both sides, pushing the Japanese to develop their subsequent imperial superiority. Following the incident in Nagasaki, the Japanese encountered these same vessels eight years later in naval skirmishes during the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95. In the ensuing years after the Nagasaki incident, Japan had poured precious national funds into augmenting its naval strength. When the two clashed in the Yellow and Bohai Seas, world opinion assessed that the much larger and more powerful Qing forces would quickly triumph over the more poorly equipped and outnumbered Imperial Japanese sailors. However, corruption and inadequate military strategic command within the Chinese ranks opened up opportunities that the Japanese exploited. The Qing were routed. It was not a row that immediately gained public attention and most Chinese expected the Qing dynasty would ultimately be victorious. Chinese newspapers touted such opinions to the public. The Chinese media referred to the Japanese as, quote, dwarf pirates, a belittling but long-standing traditional epithet, and rarely reported the actual results of battles. This lopsided view of information created a situation in which many Chinese were surprised that the war was actually lost when news of surrender negotiations suddenly appeared in the spring of 1895. Japanese newspapers published advertisements for magic lantern shows that depicted the sinking of the Qing naval forces and the subjugation of the Qing Empire. The Qing Navy piled miscalculation on top of poor strategy on top of bad luck. By early December 1894, the Japanese was celebrating the fall of Port Arthur, a vital naval outpost on the north side of China's Bohai Bay. The war was not over, but the Japanese were jubilant. On December 9, 1894, the Tokyo city government staged an enormous carnival to celebrate this singular victory, a harbinger, everyone hoped, of what was to follow. According to the program in the Yomiuri newspaper, Japanese newspaper of the time, the main event was to be held from 5 to 7 in the evening on the shores of the Shinobaza Lake in Ueno Park. The climax, hailing Japan's advances in the war even before the final outcome was determined, was a reconstruction of the fierce gun battle between the Qing warships, the Dingyuan and the Zhuyuan, and the Japanese Navy. Using colossal plaster of Paris models of the ships, they reenacted the naval encounter on the lake, complete with fireworks, to replicate the actual mortars. The spectacle of battle was employed in a propaganda orgy of self-congratulation to galvanize Japanese public opinion toward support for the military and imperial aggrandizement. The Qing loss in the major battle of the war prophesied its ultimate political demise, but this victory celebration in Japan was unparalleled. Estimates of costs were way under as attendance ran high. The final bill came to more than 14,500 yen at the time, approximately $2.5 million in current U.S. exchange rates. Extra trains between Yokohama and Tokyo were put on the rails that day to deal with the influx of visitors, overwhelming the preparations. The authorities had not planned for enough public toilets and lines snaked through the park. About 20 pickpockets were arrested. It was a substantial outlay for a victory party in the nation's capital, particularly when the coffers were already virtually bare from wartime expenditures. During this time, strident visual news leaflets, thousands of colorful battle pictures, and hundreds of new and sometimes often racist comedic routines about the Qing Empire were endemic to the Japanese media and entertainment industries. The first phase of a Japanese program of national 
mobilization was forming, and the key was linking home front emotion to battlefront success. A few months later, China's defeat in the Battle of Wei Highway marked the end of Qing naval supremacy, and by February 12, 1895, China's second key port had succumbed to Japanese naval attacks. The Japanese acquired the Junyuan as war booty, along with a whole host of other ships. In a barrage of international reporting, the vessels were often described as having been sunk or severely impaired by the Imperial Japanese Navy. The Junyuan was repaired and commandeered into the Japanese naval fleet. On its return journey to Japan, it steamed first through Nagasaki and eventually to the naval port of Yokosuka, where cheering crowds greeted its arrival. Final treaty talks resulted in the acceptance of a humiliating military loss and forced the Qing Empire to cede the island of Taiwan as reparation. The Japanese were euphoric with the triumph and fortune they received in indemnity payments, although miffed by the intervention of Russia, France, and Germany to deny Japan's fledgling empire dominion over the Liaodong Peninsula. But there was still much for the population to applaud. Japan's victory over the Qing was symbolized by the display of two colossal anchors on the edge of the Shinobazu Lake in Ueno Park as a permanent display of war booty and regional dominance. Set on large stone foundations, the anchors were an impressive visual and public manifestation of a successful imperial campaign. Elsewhere in Japan's capital, enormous panoramas that were constructed in entirely new buildings allowed city dwellers to vicariously appreciate aspects of famous battlefronts from numerous angles. These 360-degree, quote, experiences offered a visual and sonorous immersion that also trumpeted Japan's conquest. Japanese were no longer just reading about their imperial forces' victories. They could also see and experience the spoils of war, further enmeshing the public in the high-stakes game of expanding imperial borders and power. Keeping the public interested and connected to the military was considered an important element of propaganda, and war booty was designed to be put on display. An editorial in the Japanese Yomiuri newspaper proffered that such items showed, quote, the brave valor of our navy and military, and also promoted, quote, our honor and imperial power to the world. A vast array of captured armaments and personal items from the Chinese continent made their way back to Japan to be put on show not just in public parks, like the Qing naval anchors, but also in schools, at exhibits on castle grounds, and in shrines. As entertainment was gaining prominence as a mixed form of edutainment and state propaganda, the triangular link between youth, the military, and military expansion grew steadily stronger over the subsequent decades. War booty displays at the Yasukuni Shrine grew so popular that many entrepreneurs set up small shops and amusement stalls just outside the shrine grounds to sell their products. Their numbers expanded to the point that the government cracked down and ordered their removal. The Japanese newspaper, the Asahi, announced that while some war booty was to be offered to the imperial throne, the rest was to be displayed by the military at various government sites so that the population could view it. It was also to be lent to schools and to serve as a pillar of the nation's education. And not just in Tokyo. This was a national phenomenon. The spoils of war to be exploited on the national stage were not limited to military armaments and weapons. Amusements and exhibits expanded to include exotic animals. Imperial Japanese propaganda contained not only a military message, but also one glimmering of modernity and success. In 1897, the Imperial Household Ministry authorized an exhibit of animal war booty at the Ueno Zoo, not far from the mock battle that Tokyo's imperial subjects had enjoyed several years earlier. During the war with the Qing, a pair of camels had been captured at Port Arthur, and eventually they were transported to the National Zoo, where the birth of a baby camel drew much public interest. These exhibits were funded directly from the coffers of the Meiji Emperor. Along with panoramas and massive spectacles, triumphant victory arches also became de rigueur for Japanese military celebrations. Modeled in some manner on the European practice, the Japanese crafted gigantic towers to commemorate the return of the Meiji Emperor to Tokyo in 1895 from Hiroshima, where the Imperial military headquarters were located during the war with the Qing. On May 30, 1895, 
the emperor had uh, returned to a capital packed with well-wishers. Verbal descriptions do not suffice. To grasp the enormity of the scale, images have to be seen to be believed. The arches, big as they were, were only a temporary stage setting for national celebrations of Japan's conquest over the Qing. The anchors remained perched on a tiny outcrop of land in the middle of Ueno Park. Over time, they gathered dust, but they retained significance for the way Japan would orchestrate its legacy of propaganda. Into the 20th century, Japanese imperialism began to focus on pilfering items from China's vast geographic storehouse of treasures. The big events, panoramas, newspaper tie-ins, and the like continued through the next decade and drew Japanese society together even more with Japan's victory over Russia in 1905. The costs for the populace had risen in terms of the economy and war dead, but the country arguably felt even more connected to its national goals and more fully mobilized with the practice of whole villages sending off soldiers at rail stations to serve at the front. At the same time, a growing number of monuments of varying types, lauding important military victories and Japan's imperial expansion, began to dot the urban landscape. A massive bronze statue of Imperial Japanese Navy Commander Hirose Takeo, killed in the line of duty during the Russo-Japanese War, created an imposing 11-meter-high, or 36-foot, edifice in front of the Mansei Bashi Station in 1910's Tokyo. The statue commemorated Hirose as a war god. Postcards and other visual reproductions of this statue and those of other war gods were produced for sale and sent as gifts or memorabilia around the empire. The statue was one of the first positioned in front of a rail station and not located uh, in a public park or square. Postcards, postage stamps, and posters continued to proliferate in number and quality as Japan increased its presence in Manchuria. The further accumulation of railroad privileges and business concerns in the north of the Chinese continent conjoined the island to the mainland, promoting through various media the idea that Manchuria, and eventually Japan's puppet kingdom of Manchukuo, was a lifeline for the survival of the Japanese empire. While Japan was technically at war as an ally with Great Britain and France in World War I, and participated by dispatching troops to quell the Bolshevik uprising in the Siberian intervention 1918-1922, Japanese society was not being mobilized in the same way during this interwar era. However, between 1905 and 1931, the imperial military was consistently on the move on the Chinese mainland. Even during peace, military-related events and festivals remained high points of the calendar for Japanese imperial subjects. Gatherings included commemoration ceremonies for those who had fallen in the emperor's service, and events at what were called soul-gathering shrines. Frequently, these celebrations were held in castles, which had developed into national symbols of Japan's martial heritage during the Taisho era, 1912 to 1926, and the early Showa era, 1926 to 1989. Not that anyone necessarily forgot Japan's victory over the Qing during this interim, or the sacrifices made so that Japan's military could thrive. As Japan shifted out of the Meiji era, the war booty gained from the Qing was still recalled for the military services to the nation. Ah, the genuine, a book that nostalgically memorialized the vessel sold well in the first year of the Taisho era in 1912, when the ship was finally decommissioned. By the 1930s, the Japanese public was gorging on a steady diet of military celebrations in public squares, department stores and castles, viewing large memorials of, quote, godlike military heroes on avenues in major cities, and daily life was embroidered into a fabric of amusement, entertainment, and education linked in grand measure to these activities. However, nothing could match the scale and technological magic of the China Incident Holy War Exhibition, produced in Osaka in 1938. Constructed within a baseball stadium and using the surrounding gardens and parks, the event was enormous, very well attended, and profitable. The exhibit was open to the public from April 1st to May 30th, 1938. According to the Asahi newspaper's own calculations, more than 1.45 million people visited in the first two months that it ran, and the event took in a profit of 150,000 yen, a robust sum at the time. 
along with airplane rides for children, a fountain, a cinema, and full-scale mock-ups of key battles, the central attraction would have been the colossal China Continental Panorama. The stadium outfield seating area had been transformed into a massive naval destroyer, and on each floor, exhibits revealed, quote, war booty, along with detailed maps and depictions of the battles, troop movements, etc. After strolling through the five floors of that exhibit, visitors would have gone outside to what had been the baseball field to see that it had been transformed into a Chinese battlefield. Words alone do not portray the expanse. The Asahi newspaper continued its sponsorship of war-related spectacle entertainment in conjunction with the Hankyu Rail Company and the Imperial Military. The fall of the city of Wuhan, a major KMT stronghold in China, was honored with another massive, life-size war panorama model. In 1939, this structure filled the arena of the uh, Nishinomiya Sports Stadium in Hyogo Prefecture in central Japan. All of these sorts of experiential propaganda satisfied one of the conditions conducive to mobilizing a population, a constant and continuous stream of attention in the media. Asahi spared little expense, promoting its own events and its support of the war as an outgrowth of its business. Photos, long articles, constant headlines about the exhibits, and the mass interactive spectacles make joining in support of the war that much more a normal and exciting part of daily life. As the years piled up, the legacy of those Qing anchors that the Meiji Imperial Navy gained as war booty might have been forgotten. But they resurfaced as fodder for patriotic propaganda in 1942, as Japan's naval front against the Western Allies expanded toward the Pacific in World War II. On May 28, 1942, the Asahi newspaper notified the public that the monument dedication ceremony of the anchors in Ueno Park had taken place the day before as part of National Imperial Naval Memorial Day. This was, ironically, just a few weeks before the disaster at Midway, which effectively crippled the Japanese Imperial Navy and proved a turning point in the war against America. Part of the reason, perhaps, why the Qing anchors had been neglected amid the fog of war in Japan was that the country had escalated its celebratory war victories in so many other areas since 1895. One arena where attention to propaganda had more fully matured during the 1930s in a way that had not really existed before was the focus on children and entertainment, Nowhere was this trend more prevalent than in kamishibai, or paper plays. These splashily colored cardboard panels were displayed and read to audiences of mainly children in local neighborhoods around the empire, and used as the means to prepare the next generation for imperial sacrifice and war. Certainly not all the content was militarily oriented, but that tendency grew throughout the 1930s and into the early war years. Kamishibai deeply connected the periphery of the empire with the home front, and these narratives worked to produce consent and reconciliation. One fascinating example of the geographic connections fabricated for audiences can be seen in the uh, Kamishibai Rabaul and the Nail Clippers. This 1944 paper play ties a wide range of characters across the huge expanse of the empire, from Rabaul in Papua New Guinea to Japan. The story is somewhat absurd about a useful pair of nail scissors that get used around the empire and then are returned to their original owner. But Japanese propaganda was successful because it focused on more than just the glory of the empire. It linked distant venues of battlefield scenes with the mundane of home life back on the main islands for children to consume and value as a moral but exciting lesson. And importantly, Enjoying Kamishibai incorporated this connective and emotional fabric of a shared ideology for all layers of society, not just military soldiers or adults. The second fundamental element to understanding the history of Japanese imperial propaganda centers on the fact that the fall of the Japanese empire did not mean longer-term impact of the propaganda disappeared. By contrast, while contemporary Japanese have frequently forgotten about their wartime edutainment, its effects retain a political salience in contemporary China. The history of the former Qing warships, the Junyuan and the Dingyuan, continued to be recalled in service of the Chinese state. 
The narrative of the Qing dynasty's humiliation at the hands of Imperial Japan is still vividly recounted, albeit most frequently in modern Chinese museums or on TV shows. Equally important is the particular evolution of this memory and how it has endured in China. This national humiliation of China, as the phrasing goes, began with the Qing dynasty, which the Chinese masses overthrew in the 1911 revolution. The emotional national burden was then conveniently borrowed by the subsequent Republic of China and shared with the political party that evolved to run the nascent country by the later 1920s. This was the KMT, or Chinese Nationalist Party. But the inherited, quote, humiliation did not cease. Decades after the Chinese Communist Party's conquest over the Chinese nationalists in 1949, the People's Republic of China now shoulders those same symbols of Qing dynasty humiliation as part of its own version of modern Chinese history. As one scholar contends, we should be wary of simply using the term China as if it were a single continuous political entity with 5,000 years of history. Instead, we should view modern China as the collection of a number of histories that are now so tightly entwined as a unified national narrative that it is difficult to separate origin myths from facts on the ground. What is noteworthy is that the struggle to control the propaganda narrative did not end with the end of World War II in 1945, when Japan's imperial power was vanquished. Chinese national forces began to negotiate with Japanese and U.S. officials about returning the massive Qing anchors that had been so important to imperial propaganda in 1895. Theoretically, the KMT had no real legal claim to them since the booty had been part of the Qing Empire. But the naval vessels represented the KMT's lineage as heir to the, quote, Chinese humiliation that the Qing Empire had suffered. Restoring lost national pride would go a long way to bolstering how the Chinese public viewed the KMT. Chinese Nationalist Military Attaché Lieutenant Commander Zhong Hanbo played a key role in this process. He was a naval officer sent as part of the Allied forces to represent China and to assist in the occupation of Japan in the early years of post-World War II. In his memoirs, he wrote that he felt being able to occupy Japan after World War II as one of the four victorious nations expunged the hundred years of humiliation China had experienced. What was at stake for Zhong and others of his generation was a chronicle of national competition that predated the entire Western narrative about the Second World War. In the Western narrative, Japan became an enemy in the late 1930s, more pointedly, of course, after December 1941. But in the Chinese view, like Zhong's, the desire for China to upstage Japan in the post-war was a story that long predated World War II and had stronger links to the growth of the Japanese empire from the late 19th century more than half a century prior. The Chinese mission in Japan, part of the occupation authorities, but a force with few teeth, since it had no power to dispatch any significant military to back its opinions, requested the anchors and leftover artillery shells, part of the war booty taken by the Japanese after the Sino-Japanese War 50 years earlier. Quote, it is the belief of the Chinese mission, KMT officials wrote, that public display of such objects should be at once discontinued and that the objects should be dismantled and brought back to China, end quote. Initially, the Supreme Can Commander for the Allied Powers, SCAP, which oversaw the occupation of Japan essentially under American authority, cared little for this maneuver. SCAP indicated that incidents before 1937 were not in its purview. However, it seems that by suggesting in subsequent letters that the objects glorified war and militarism and were in contravention of educating the Japanese people in the fundamental principles of peace, the Chinese mission appears to have worn down American recalcitrance. Ultimately, the KMT was able to procure the anchors and return the war booty in a sort of reverse patriation ceremony that attempted to publicly expunge the humiliation of the Qing Empire's loss. The Japanese celebration of the spoils of war from the Qing Empire in the late 19th century had encouraged naval officer Zhong to call for the return of those, quote, victory relics. On May 31, 1947, a small article in the Chinese Foreign Ministry Weekly 
noted that Japan had returned two anchors from the genuine and 10 cannonballs to Shanghai. The article interestingly termed the weapons as part of, quote, our Navy, and the materials as having been, quote, stolen by Japan and put on display in Ueno Park for the previous 50 years. But the Chinese massage of the historical narrative was not yet complete. A few years later, in 1949, when mainland China switched to rule under the Chinese Communist Party, the anchors once again became an important part of national history under new management. The propaganda story that had originated in 1895 between Imperial Japan and the Qing Empire would continue long past its expiration date. Only this time, the story needed to be linked to the communist version. Today, the anchors are on display at the Military Museum of the Chinese People's Revolution in Beijing. This is not just any museum, but one of the ten monumental buildings decreed by Premier Zhou Enlai to symbolize New China and completed in October of 1959. The museum was expressly designed and constructed with the aim to establish the hegemony of the interpretation of history by controlling both the retelling of the past and the means of representation. Even though the history is seemingly unrelated, the Nanjing Massacre Museum also houses a picture of the sunken genuine warship with the aim of promoting a historical thesis that the true start of Japanese violent imperialism began in 1895 and not solely with the 1937 massacre in Nanjing. Mainland Chinese government views of Japan often push the idea that there had been a single plan from that time or earlier in the 1870s with the military expedition to Taiwan of a Japanese imperial goal to colonize East Asia. The memory of this history remained relegated to the Chinese mainland because the Chinese Nationalist Party fled to the island of Taiwan after losing the Civil War in 1949. Competition to control the historical narrative continued, but obscured the repatriation of the anchors. In fact, the guardians of Chinese historical memory split into two the Communist People's Republic of China, the PRC, with its capital in Beijing, and the Republic of China, ROC, later known as Taiwan, with what at the time was considered a temporary capital in Taipei. A few months before the repatriation of the anchors that naval officer Zhang had managed, a riot erupted in the former Japanese colony of Taiwan, which devolved into a large massacre beginning on February 28, 1947. Over the course of several months, this social unrest led to the killing of tens of thousands of native Taiwanese, among others, and it came to be known as the 228 Incident. The unrest also impelled the shaky KMT rulers to implement martial law on the island of Taiwan, which in fits and starts eventually ruled Taiwan until the mid-1980s. Ironically, while the KMT was striving to expunge the humiliation of Qing-era mistakes, it was simultaneously trying to create a new political identity based on this heritage in the former Japanese colonial outpost of Taiwan. These anchors of history, as I labeled the use of the Qing warships in both the late 19th century and then mid 20th century propaganda, demonstrate that friction in Sino-Japanese relations did not suddenly arise at the end of the Second World War. Governments on the Chinese mainland chose to position themselves as successors to the legacy of the Qing era humiliation. This is paradoxical because the various governments after 1911 and 1949 all declared that they were revolutionary and thus throwing off the shackles of the past. Their subsequent search for justice and requests for the repatriation of war booty suggests, however, that long-standing feelings of what it meant to be Chinese in the face of Japanese aggression, regardless of the chronology, played a serious political role. This incongruous nature of claiming a revolutionary break with the past, but then providing continuity on the level of historical emotions, remains a potent theme in Sino-Japanese relations. In some ways, history is in continuous political use, and the time has come to start looking more deeply into the archaeology of imperial propaganda. The manner in which wars and post-wars are written about, memorialized, and commemorated in East Asia informs us as much about the legacy of that propaganda as the materials at the time did. We need to pull away from the tyranny of domestic history standing in for a much richer and more complex understanding that transnational perspectives offer. What narcissistic versions of domestic history do not allow for 
is plasticity, the flexibility of allegiance and serendipity. This concept is important when looking at the evolution of Japanese imperial propaganda and the responses to it in East Asia. The memory of the Japanese empire was transmitted through successive Chinese governments, even though they all claimed they were revolutionary in their own way. Ruling authority certainly changed from the Qing dynasty through KMT rule in the 1920s to the Chinese Communist Party by 1949, but public memory did not always necessarily follow suit. How the Japanese responded to those transformations during the same eras helped shape the world we currently face. The acts of remembering and forgetting by the Chinese communists, the Chinese nationalists, and the Japanese demonstrate how the textures of imperial Japanese propaganda left a much larger footprint than previously recognized on the complex network of wartime and post-war relationships in the region. Thank you very much.